Praise the Lord. Church, I said, praise the Lord. I welcome you to an inspiring service this morning in Jesus' name. I pray the Lord will influence your life, impact your life, inspire your life. Higher and higher will all will go in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for such a service today. Thank you for ministering to our hearts from all directions. And thank you for your word enriching our lives. We're asking, O oh Lord, that again as we look at your word, you show us good, wondrous, wonderful things in your word in Jesus' name. Bless all our newcomers. Bless all our young people. Bless all our fathers and mothers. Bless all our workers and leaders. We're asking, Lord, that your word will uproot every evil thing from every life in Jesus' name. And plant something good. Plant something energizing to every life today in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us as we look at the word. And let your spirit breathe on the word. Make it alive for everyone. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody else there will shout, Amen. We're coming to James chapter 4. And I read to you from verse 6, verse 7. Verse 8 and verse 10. James chapter 4. I read to you from verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil. And it will flee from you. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. And he shall lift you up. And the Almighty God from today will lift you up in Jesus' name. Lift up your hands. Lift up your heart. Lift up your skill. Lift up everything you've got. And make you to have progress in your life, in your ministry, in Jesus' name. Surprisingly, as we look at this chapter, the apostle is telling us about... The believers increasing grace. The believers increasing grace. Many people thought, I got saved through grace. I got sanctified through grace. I'm filled, I'm saturated, I'm baptized, I'm immersed, I'm empowered in the Holy Ghost by grace and they think that is where grace stops but he says every time you wake up and you look at the victories in the past and you look at the power that would make you overcame overcome in the past and you know there might be new challenges in front of you he says remember he giveth Continuous tense, he giveth, that means he keeps on giving more grace. That whatever grace you had had in the past, as you face a new challenge today, he giveth more grace. He's telling us, as the oceans are full of water, and how much water you might have drunk in the past, he giveth more water. And as you breathe the air, and you fill your lungs with life-strengthening air, 
It says, keep on breathing. It gives more air. It says, as you have vitality, and you have strength, and you have run through the troops, and you have climbed over the mountains and the hills, and then you come to a new day, and you come to a new challenge, it says, look up. There is no mountain too high. There is no challenge so great you cannot overcome. It gives more grace. As so change from one level of life as a single person to a married person, and you are thinking, in this marital stage, am I going to be able to pull through and be as strong and be as lively and be as enthusiastic as I was before I, get, I got married? It says, remember, you gave us more grace. Some things happened in your life. Or you heard it happened in the lives of other people. And you say, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Because if that happens to me, I collapse. I'll not be able to stand. He says, no, don't say that. He gives more grace. More grace. Every time, whatever the challenge, every time, whatever the stage, every time, whatever the standing, he gives more grace. There is increasing grace for every challenge that comes in life. And now, there's a word we shrink from. There's a situation we draw back from. It is when somebody who is more powerful than we are, if he decides it's going to concentrate on us and push us down, it's going to concentrate on us and reject us. And it's going to make everybody that is important in our lives reject us and resist us. And you say, I don't think I can stand this one. Rejection is one of the words we're shrink from. And when the most powerful in the whole universe, apart from God, when he decides to come against your life and he wants to bring you down and pull you down and destroy you, you say, I'm gone. Don't say that. Resist the devil. He's strong. You can resist him. He appears authoritative. You can resist him. He appears irresistible, but you can resist him. We have power untapped. We have power unutilized. We have power unknown. That if that devil in his greatest strength, if that devil in his highest strategy, if that devil with all the history of the people he had defeated in the past, if he comes against you, you can overcome him. And you will overcome him. That's why it says, resist the devil. Don't say it's the devil. It's brought Adam and Eve down. What can I do? It's brought Samson down. What can I do? He provoked David. And David fell into his trap. What can I do? He inspired, instigated Herod against John. What can I do? He says, you can do something. This is a new day. A day of power. A day of authority. A day of victory. And a day of overcoming. Resist the devil. What will he do? Tell me what he'll do. When you resist him. And he will flee from you. The time has come. All the untapped power 
all the unutilized power we're going to take and we're going to be victorious this year for you will be the greatest year you ever lived second corinthians i'm reading from chapter nine second corinthians chapter nine and i'm reading from verse eight second corinthians chapter nine verse eight and god is able to make all grace abound toward you that she always having all sufficiency in all things look at that always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work that's me i say that's me you will rejoice chapter 12 of second corinthians i'm reading from verse 9 chapter 12 verse 9 and you said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee any amen in the house my grace is sufficient for thee i look ahead and i see challenges and before i think can i can i not i hear a voice from heaven my grace is sufficient for you i hear news i hear information of something that has to be done and i'm saying lord find somebody to do that and then he points at me and he said you are the one to do that impossible thing and i say me and before i talk further he says my grace is sufficient for you i see those who have gone before me and those who have gone before me i see them falling into a pit into a pitfall and I see another one, and he's falling. And I hear of another one, and he's falling. And then I ask, what made him fall? What made her fall? And they tell me, this, this made him fall. And the same trial. And the same temptation is coming my way. And I said, the people who are stronger than I, they couldn't stand, they fell. And then I hear a voice from the Spirit of God. And he says, what's he telling you today? My grace is sufficient for you. I'm looking at the Word of God this morning on a subject the believers increasing grace and uh, underutilized power. The power we have. Underutilized. The believers increasing grace and underutilized power. And I pray that today the Lord will lift you up, give you greater victory and give you greater dominion and that increasing grace will become a reality in your life in jesus name and the untold power the untapped power the underutilized power the lord will inject into your spirit you are going to be strong I am going to be stronger. Three things we're looking at. Number one, our shield from the simple world. The simple world is not just simple. The simple world is corrupt. The simple world is cruel. The sinful world is oppressive. The sinful world is destructive. The sinful world stands in your way and it says you cannot pass. And I have a shield, the shield of his grace. 
the shield of his power, the shield of his anointing, the shield from the sinful world. The Lord will protect you. The Lord will shield you. And whatever comes from the world, you are more than a conqueror. Point number two, the secret of our spiritual wealth. The secret of our spiritual wealth. You are richer than you thought. You are richer than you know. And the Lord has given us the path that leads to that spiritual wealth. The secret of our spiritual wealth. Point number three, our submissiveness to his supreme will. Our submissiveness to his supreme will. From all eternity, he thought about you. Not just the world. Not just the whole of humanity. You as an individual, he thought about you. He thought about when you'll be born. He thought about when you come to this life. And he marked out for you the peak, the place, the top of the mountain that you ought to reach. He outlined for you everything you ought to do as you come to this world and you came as a baby helpless innocent knowing nothing and he knows it all and he declares the end from the beginning and that's the reason you need to link up with him so that he'll say there's a first year this is what I plan for you to do. And you submit to that will. Second year, this is what I planned. He looks at his record. This is what I planned. You will do. And you step in. And then as we're getting older, as we're now in the kingdom, and as we're moving on in the kingdom, this is where to go. You will hear a voice behind you. This is the way. Walk ye therein. And as you walk step by step, day by day, month after month, and year after year, in subjection, in submission to his supreme will, what he had destined for you from all eternity, he will fulfill in your life in Jesus' name. Number one, our shield from the sinful world. Number two, the secret of our spiritual wealth. Number three, our submissiveness to the supreme will. Number one, let's come back to James chapter four from verse one. James chapter four, verse one. From wings come wars. And fighting is among you. Come they not haste, even of your own lusts that war in your members, ye lost, and have not, ye kill, and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not. Because he has not, he ask and receive not. Because he has commit that she may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enemy, is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He mentions quite a lot of things there. Remember, God has a destiny for you. God 
has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. And you need the shield of the Lord from all the things that will contradict the purpose and plan and strategy and calling of God for your life. So that in spite of everything that happens, you will get to where you ought to get to. Salvation comes and separates us from the world. Salvation comes and shields us from the sinful world. And we're delivered from the spirit of the world. And we're delivered from the corruption of the world. Look at the things that I mentioned there. Number one, he mentions fighting. Number two, he mentions war. Number three, he mentions lust. Number four, he mentions enmity. Number five, he mentions killing, hatred, murder. Number six, he mentions lost, evil desires. And number seven, he mentions pride. What are they? They're just the manifestations of the world. Look at um, John chapter 18, verse 36. John chapter 18, and I'm reading from verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. The world and fighting. If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight. Then he says that I might not be delivered unto the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from haste, fighting coming from the world. War. Look at Second Peter chapter two, verse eleven. Second Peter chapter two, verse eleven. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims. In this world, were strangers, were pilgrims. That's why the world does not know us. And the world did not know him. It says we're strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. War is of this world. And that war in this world is pointed at, is directed at the pilgrims and uh, the strangers. Look at lost. We're looking at First John chapter 2, reading from verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That already tells you something. There's the love of the world. That one will not take us to heaven. And God has heaven as your destiny. You'll get there. And then it's the love of the Father inside your heart that will draw you to heaven. And the love of the world, lost, wants to enter in to crouch out and to drive out the love of the Father in your heart. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that word lost there means inordinate desire, inappropriate desire, improper desire, exaggerated desire, wrong desire for the things of this world that will come into your life, crowd out, drive out the love of God, and it's of the world. Everything, the fighting, the war, the lust, is of the world. It says, for all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of their eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world and the world passes away and the lost thereof but she that doeth the will of God abideth how long? forever enmity enmity is also of the world you see all those things that the apostle James is telling us about and he mentions spites of the world war of the world lust of the world enmity with God that's also of the world that cannot be of heaven heaven is in love with the almighty God but enmity is of the world look at second chronicles chapter 18 second chronicles chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 6 but you shepherd said is there not here a prophet of the lord besides that we might inquire of him and the king of israel said unto Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But Jehoshaphat, you know what? The man is so addicted to God, he's so committed to God, and he's so committed to whatever the Lord tells him. He doesn't look at my face. He doesn't think of how I feel. He doesn't think of whether I'm going to accept or reject what he's saying. He's so committed to God. And you know what, Jehoshaphat? I hate him. I hate him. It's at enmity with the man, the man of truth. Because it's at enmity with God, the God of truth. For he never prophesied anything good unto me but always evil he have understand where there is evil there's devil where there is evil there is evil behavior and it's going to be evil consequence if you stopped evil then all the evil message that you say is coming to you will not come but hey, Ahab, you are the one that positioned yourself in a place the evil is coming. You don't have to hate God or hate the man of truth, but enmity against God. That's why the prophet came to Jehoshaphat, chapter 19, verse 2. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Friendship with the world, friendship with the haters of God, friendship with the doubtful, dubious, deceitful people in society. Loving the people that hate God, therefore is wrath upon thee before the Lord. I pray God will deliver us from the world. And then James talks about desires, remember, what the Lord is revealing to us is that all these things one by one, they come from the world. They are associated with the world. They grow out of the root in the world. It tells us now about desires in Mark chapter 4 from verse 19. Mark chapter 4. 
verse 19 and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the world once you get married to the world first of all you have been separated from the world but the world is cunning and they're showing the things that glitter the things that shine but they're not real gold and they're bringing their entertainment they're bringing all their invitations and you'll be saying no 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 because god has a destiny for me and then they try to make you forget that destiny that goal and that peak the lord is calling you to and eventually you turn a little let me even see the things they are talking about whether it's good or not in fact what am i even rejecting when i've not seen her? whether it is bitter or sweet why am i pushing them away without even listening to them so balak you can send back those people i didn't even listen to them i didn't listen to their argument to their reasoning to their proposal and how they come you know he'll make you rich he'll uplift you he will grant you this and that our land is rich and whatever you have whatever you want he'll grant unto you and then the desire for those other things begin to enter in and eventually they choke the world and become as unfruitful and then pride we're coming back to first john chapter 2 first john chapter 2 reading from verse 16 in first john chapter 2 verse 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life the pride of life all these we're told they are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passes away. The fashion of the world passing away. The entertainments of the world passing away. The theaters of the world passing away. The games of the world passing away. The politics of the world passing away everything of the world that is trying to attract you eventually will use you and dump you use you and abandon you use you and throw you away the world passes away and the loss thereof but he that doeth the will of god tell me abideth forever and now the apostle mentions another scene he mentions killing you know it's of the world killing is of the world first john chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 13 first john chapter 3 we're reading from verse 13 in verse 13 marvel not my brethren, if the world, the world, the world hates you, hatred is of the world. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer when james said he kill it doesn't mean that you kill by the knife by the machete 
by the gun every time. You can kill with your tongue. You can kill with your pain. You can kill with what you post on the website, on the net. You can kill and stimulate hatred for somebody and all those people, the kill is joy. The kill is happiness. The kill is uh, thoughtfulness. It doesn't even have the thought of getting up and doing something. Is discouraged. Is downtrodden. And is trodden on the foot. And he himself says, I give up. Give up. Because of what has been said about him everywhere. You can kill in various ways. And it's not just taking somebody's life, but you take the life of the soul, the excitement in his spirit, the joy in his mind, and the willingness to live, and the excitement to live from a man and he says, what am I living for? There's no use trying again. You've killed the man. And he said the word. Verse 15, whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer, killer, has everlasting life, eternal life, abiding in him. But who overcome? I overcome. There's a shield, the shield of salvation. There's a shield, the shield of power. There's a shield, the shield of dominion that keeps us shielded, sheltered, protected from the world. Come to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I read from verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins. That he might deliver us from the present evil world. He delivers us from the fightings in the world, the war in the world, the lost in the world, the enmity of the world, the wrong desires of the world, the pride in the world, the hatred of the world. You are delivered. That he might deliver us from the present evil world. According to the will of God our Father. Let's come to Galatians chapter 6. I read from verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory. Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me. That world is powerless. That world is helpless. Concerning you, the world is crucified unto you. And I unto the world. Thank God I have the victory. Say it for yourself. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 12. Here is our victory. Here is our shield. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Wrestling, fighting, struggling, battling, warring, against spiritual wickedness, in high places, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day. Anybody going through challenges there? You will stand. I said you will stand. No matter from the depths of the world, that assault may be coming from. Thank God you have overcome already. 
that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, above all, don't forget this, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench, tell me, all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I welcome you to the overcoming life. First, Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3 of Second Peter chapter 1, according as his divine power, he has given unto us, how many things? All things that pertain unto life and to godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these things the Lord has given to us, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Having, tell me, having, say it aloud, let Satan hear, escape the corruption that is in the world through laws we have overcome. And now we live the victorious life. Now I live the victorious life. Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. James chapter 4. Now that we're shielded from the world, and we have dominion over the world, now we're ready to climb every mountain. We're ready to take every challenge. We're ready to move forward and we're going to succeed. I am ready to move on. I am ready to move forward. I'm climbing. I'm climbing. I am climbing. And I will get there. Point number two, the secret of our spiritual wealth. The secret of our spiritual wealth. Look at verse 6. But he giveth more grace. That's the secret. Wherefore he says, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. That's the secret. Submit yourselves therefore to God, that's the secret. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the secret. Draw near to God. And he in all his majesty and all his power will draw near unto you. That's the secret. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, so that the Lord will not say anything unclean in your life, in your hand, and turn away from you. And Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, that means be sober, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, that, and your joy to heaviness. If you are 
gambled with your life, if you have gambled with the will of God, if you have gambled with your chances, and your chances and your privileges are slipping away from you through your fingers. It says, don't say, I don't care, I don't mind, I may not be able to climb any mountain, I may, so, I may not succeed, I may not be able to run, and I may not be able to have my opportunities in life, I don't care. The opportunities have slipped away through my fingers. I don't mind. It says, don't act like that. There's still a better future in front of you. And one day, in the future, only one day, you can gain what you have lost in 10 years. Only one month, this new month, you can recover everything the Amalekites have taken from your family, you can recover everything. Then it says, mourn for your carelessness in the past. And let the Lord forgive. And let the Lord cleanse. And then get ready. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And it will lift you up. There's a lifting up. I said there is a lifting up. Today, he'll cancel everything, pulling you down, coming from your past. He will energize you. He will lift you up. He will promote you. He will pull you up to the top of the mountain in Jesus' name. What is the secret? The secret of our spiritual wealth. Number one, submit to God. Submit to God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. And we give them reverence, honor, respect. Shall we not much more be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Look up here. We went to school. And whenever we brought back our report sheet, report card, and we failed. Our fathers would take the whip, they called it the cudgel, and give us strokes of the cane and say, you must do better, you must do better. They gave us the pain and we submitted to them. But the pity is our earthly fathers cannot improve on our brain. Our earthly fathers could not change our habits of laziness of not reading. Our earthly fathers could not effectively pull us away from the bad gang, bad company that is making us to fail. And it says, now God, the creator, he looks at the destiny he has for you. And he looks at you going the opposite direction. And he corrects you. And he says, the way forward is the way of submission. And he can touch your brain. He will touch your brain. And he will touch your business. He can touch your business. And he can change and turn foolishness unto wisdom. He'll give you wisdom. And he can show his favor unto you. And it can bring help us to come from every direction and move you forward in life. It says the secret of our spiritual wealth is that like we submitted to our human parents who could not change our situation. We should now surrender and submit to the Lord who will change our destiny to match the picture he has in mind. Wherever you are now, I see you on the top. 
Whatever has drawn you back, as you submit to God today, he will forget the past. A new life, upward, forward, heavenly, will come for you in Jesus' name. James chapter 4, verse 7, second part of verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's all the amen you can give. Yeah. The devil will come under your feet. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh is about seeking whom he may devour. He will not find you. Whom receives steadfast in the faith, push him back. From your life, push him back. From your business, push him back. From your family, push him back. From your career, push him back. I was waiting for you, amen. And from your future, push him back in Jesus' name. He is going to hell. He is looking for a companion. I will not be his companion. He is lonely. He is walking the way to hellfire. And he is feeling lonely. And he wants a companion. Look at me here. He has lost me forever. I said, he has lost me forever. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We have overcomers in the house today. You are going to discover as you walk out of the service today, you feel stronger. You feel mightier. And you feel more purposeful in your life. And you know you are going to climb every mountain. Yeah. Romans chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Under my feet shortly. Under my feet shortly. And then it says in James chapter 4, God resists the proud. That means then if you want God to draw you near, draw me nearer, draw me nearer, draw me nearer God. If you want him to draw you nearer, you will forsake all forms of pride. Look at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. Now I Nebuchadnezzar praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride is able to abase. I will not be part of them. James tells us, number four, draw near to God. Draw near to God. And the Lord is going to draw near unto you. In uh, Hebrews chapter 10, remember, when God is near, Satan will be far away. When God is near, Dagon will fall to the ground. Even when you have not fasted too long, and you have not prayed too much, just having God near, Dagon will fall from your life. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near 
with a true heart in full assurance of faith. In full assurance of faith. We're drawing near to the God of all impossibilities. We're drawing near to God who can remove every mountain. We're drawing near to God who can heal every sickness. We're drawing near to God who can turn defeat into victory. We're drawn near to the God of deliverance and the God of dominion. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised they'll fulfill that promise today and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together have you noticed that although you have the such the scripture booklet in your hand and you read it at home. And after reading at home, you knelt now and you prayed. And you read James chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. And you could even tell other people. You could even recite the memory verse. And now we came here this morning. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And you heard our teacher during the time of searching the scriptures. And he thought that same thing you read back at home. Did you get anything? Did you gain anything? That's why you cannot say, I have the Bible. I can read it by myself. And I have all those materials. I can read them by myself. Don't forget the assembling of ourselves together. There are some blessings God has reserved for you, when you come into the fellowship of the brethren, you will come. You have come already. You will not go back empty-handed in Jesus' name. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as she see that days approaching and then in James chapter 4 it tells us in verse 8 cleanse your hands you sinners how do we cleanse our hands in the blood of the lamb that was shed for us Pilate did not understand he took water and he washed his hands and he said I am innocent. No, Pilate, you still surrendered him. He didn't have the power. He didn't have the courage. He washed his son. I am innocent. He delivered Christ to be crucified. Water does not do it. It's the blood of Jesus. Through the promise of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. And when you spread your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together. Love is inviting you. Grace is inviting you. Mercy is inviting you. The goodness of God is inviting you. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Do your sins be as scarlet? They shall be as white as snow. Amen. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 
Verse 19, everybody read. One, two, three, go. Anybody going to eat the good of the land there? There's goodness in this land. It's hidden from the people who do not know God. It will be revealed unto you. If he be willing and obedient, he shall eat the good of the land. Then he said, purify your hearts. Why? Because there is a seat for you in heaven. There is a place for you in paradise. And nobody will take your place. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. That's why we need to purify the heart. You go back to Calvary. You go back to the cross of Christ. And that blood that flowed at Calvary for your redemption, for your purification, for your sanctification, will purify your heart. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Come back to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, reading from verse 10, it says in verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Your boss may decide for one reason or the other, he doesn't like your look. He doesn't like your church. He doesn't like your tribe. He doesn't like your devotedness to the Lord. And therefore, he says, in this place, you will not make it. I smile and laugh at him. If he will not lift you up, God will lift you up. If he will not promote you, and he will deny you. And he's still remembering the things you did which you have apologized for. You have even made restitution. And he says, you don't come out of that place, you go to church, you will be like a beggar. That's not true. He might become a beggar, and you will have something to give to him. But you know, the secret of our spiritual wealth is humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he, the almighty God, will lift you up. Say a good, good amen. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself. I'm waiting for you. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Who is that one? He'll exalt you. In James chapter 4, verse 11. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. Speak no evil of another. Hear no evil of another. If there were no hearers, there'll be no speakers. Have you found out? Somebody is eager to speak evil. He is pregnant of gossip. He is pregnant of tale bearing. But there's nobody around. And so he cannot talk. He needs a hearer. He needs a listener. Before he can open his mouth, speak evil of no man. 
hear evil of no man. If there were no hearers of evil, there will be no speakers of evil. Somebody wants to speak evil. You are around there, but you are too busy. You are on the phone, and you are talking to somebody. And you are so excited about the person you are talking to. You are saying, yes, that's right. We'll do it. That's the way to go. Yes, I agree with you. That's wonderful. And you seem to be excited with the person you're talking about, and you cannot see. And he's watching and watching and watching. He wants to speak evil, but you are not available. You are not available. You are not available to hear what he's saying or what he wants to say. Speak evil of no man. Hear evil of no man. If there were no hearers, there will be no speakers of evil. Somebody wants to speak evil. And then you begin to talk to God. God, I thank you that you have forgiven me. I was bad. Now you made me good. I was graceless. You have made me gracious. And you're talking to God. And you're so excited about what you're talking to God about. And uh, because of that, you're still waiting. You know, but you're so, you're so taken. You know, and you're so immersed in the prayer you're praying. And you're not available to hear. Speak evil of no man. Hear evil of no man. If there were no hearers, there will be no speakers of evil. You will not speak evil. You will not hear evil. You know, so what's somebody going to say? Is going to say, you know, that person is a dirty fellow. It's a useless fellow. It's a simple fellow. It's not a serious person. You say, you know what? You're talking about me. Without the grace of God, that's what I was. I was careless. I was sinful. I was bad. If you knew me, what you're talking about that person, you're talking about me. That's the way I was, and that's who I was before grace came into my life. And if that person can talk like that about that person to you, he'll go and talk about you to another person too. But you say, God has forgiven me, and God has cleansed me. I'm so grateful to God for what he has done for me, and so I'm not interested in hearing about another person who is just like I was without the grace of God in my life. Grace has come in, and grace has made the difference, and I will not make fun of somebody who is even better than I am, or if not for the grace of God. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. Titus chapter 3, verse 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. This is how victory will come in your life. This is how success will come in your life. This is how dominion will come in your life. You will win the victory. Good, good, amen. Yeah. Heaven rendering it, amen. Yeah. Answer, solution, miracle, walking, amen. Yeah. Point number three now, our submissiveness to his supreme will. God is thinking about you. God is thinking about me. God is thinking about your family. He has something high and something great and something marvelous for you. And you have to go to him. And when you make your plans, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, then you say, hold on, hold on. I don't know what God has in store for me today. I don't know the new places he wants me to reach today. I don't know the business he has reserved for me today. I don't know the prayer I prayed in the past that is going to answer today. Although I planned this and I planned this and I planned that, I subject everything to the supreme will of God so that whatever God has ordained for me today, that's what I will submit to. Are you here, amen now? James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 13. 
James chapter 4 verse 13 Go to now Ye that say Today or tomorrow We will go Into such a city And continue there A year and buy And sell and get gain Maybe that's not What he wants for you Maybe that's a lower kind of gain Maybe that's Too small Maybe in comparison with the divine will, that one is too low. Whereas, verse 14, ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that passes, that appeared for a little time, and then vanishes away. Tomorrow, 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 who? Look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27, reading from verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Leave it in the hands of God. You don't know tomorrow. You don't know what will come tomorrow. Spend the time receiving strength from the Lord for the challenges of tomorrow. Instead of bragging, instead of boasting, tomorrow I'll do this, I'll do that. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. I pray that tomorrow will bring forth the plan of God for your life. That thing you've been waiting for, I pray tomorrow you'll meet face to face with that opportunity in Jesus' name. James chapter 4, reading from verse 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord will, that's why. When you write anything, you, know, you say D V, capital D, capital V, is the Latin for if God permits, if God wills. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, we shall do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Only the will of God will be done in your life. The will of Satan cancelled. The will of your enemies cancelled. The will of your ignorant self cancelled. The will of deceivers and destroyers cancelled. If the Lord will, the Lord has spoken concerning you, good things are going to happen. Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord shall stand. Concerning uh, what you are pregnant of, if you are pregnant of a baby, the will of the Lord shall stand. The Lord who gave you will preserve it for you until the day of delivery in Jesus' name. You are pregnant of good ideas and God implanted those good ideas in your heart. You will not have thought. Your plans will not have miscarriage. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord shall stand in your life in Jesus' name. It will be done. Great things ahead of you, I said it will be done. Great proposals, I said it shall be done. Lean on the Lord and stay with the Lord. Good things have started happening already. 
Look at this in James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, to him that knows to do good, and doeth it not, tell me, to him it is sin. A man was about to die. He had property. He had houses. He had money. And he was sick. But his children were grudging him. They thought they shouldn't have been walking. The father, with all his wealth, with everything he has got, should have given me that house. I shouldn't be paying house rent. And the father, instead of allowing me to sweat and to earn my living, should have just made life easy for me. They were grudging their father. He was about to die. They were coming. They will go out. They will be looking at him. Stingy man. Stingy father. He never gives anything. And the father had a paper that spoke beside him. He knew he was going. He was going to write his will. And I was this uh, young person. He had been uh, a servant in the house. He knew the children. He knew the father. And he just felt he should go to the father. He's been walking. He's not been very near. And he came near to the father. That is his boss. And he said, good afternoon, sir. I see you are going through some turmoil, some pain and all that. What can I do for you? And, you know, he took the little money he had. He did good. He bought this and bought that and took care of that father. And then, uh, as the father was about to go, he wrote in his will the name of that servant. Not a relative, just a servant. And he wrote a big, big amount to be given to that person and for the children, just because of the father, he gave a little thing there, a little thing there, a little thing there that almost amounted to nothing. And the servant that did good, he was the one that had a lion's share of his will. And then when the father passed on and the children saw the word they had, they said, I wish I had gone to daddy before he left. I wish I had done this. I wish I had done this. They didn't do the good they ought to do. And to them, they knew to do good, and they did it not. And that sin kept on haunting them in their poverty. That servant that remembered his boss and did good just at the point the boss was about going. He had a lion's share of the goodness reserved by that father. You know what? The Lord is looking at you. At every opportunity you have, do good in that person's life. You are sowing in the field of God. Do good in that person's life. You are sowing in the field of God. And you are going to reap abundantly. Do good goodness will come to you. Plenty will come to you. The will of God will be fulfilled in your life. In Jeremiah chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected edge. I see it coming. And it's coming your way in Jesus' name. Then shall ye call upon me. And ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. Today is the day of answered prayer. Verse 13. And ye shall seek me. And ye shall find me. When ye shall search for me with all your heart. Something good waiting for you. You'll climb every mountain. You will reach the peak of the mountain. Laughter will never stop in your life. 
more grace, more mercy, ever increasing grace, that unutilized power, and that underutilized power, and that untold power, enter into your life right now in Jesus' name. Go out, do good at every opportunity. And as you live, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. It is starting now. Where are you? I said it is starting now. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Stand up and tell the Lord, it's starting now. It's starting now. Goodness and mercy in your life. Goodness and mercy in your life. Goodness. Don't think about evil. You're not doing evil. You're not speaking evil. You're not planning evil. Evil will be far away from you. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, the goodness you're expecting is starting right now. to the Lord. It's a new day in your life. No matter the new challenge you are facing, there's a new grace available for that challenge. Talk to God, beloved. He gives more grace. And as your challenges as the size of the challenges that comes across your way, so shall be the size of the grace that God will release unto you. He gives more grace. Don't walk by sight. Don't see just according to what is around you, because there's a great future. The servant of God has prophesied it. Remember, believe his prophets. Believe the word that has been prophesied concerning you. Your future has been described when you face the most formidable foes. Remember, there's an untapped power to overcome the devil. Even if Satan is standing by your side, you always remember that God said, I am with you always, even not to the end of the world. It happened to other people, they failed. And you see what happened to Adam when the devil confronted him in the Garden of Eden. And you saw how Samson fell. Don't let that terrify you. The Lord says, he will carry you through. You identify what made them fall. You identify the mistakes in their lives. And you say, this will never be my end. And take all the adoration. <clears throat> Father, we thank you because of your love. Thank you for the opportunity to always come to pray. Thank you for the privilege to always come to pray. Thank you for the glorious privilege to always come to pray. Father, we ask even as we pray about our marriage, husband and wife, spouse together, we ask, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will bless us, you will reveal, O oh God, great things to us this morning, and you will help us where we are defaulted, where we are not doing right, when we are not doing what we should we should be doing, we ask, O oh Lord, that you have mercy upon us so and you help us, Lord, to be up and doing in Jesus' name. Father, we pray and ask this morning that your spirit will be with us, 
Your power will be with us and your grace will be with us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to begin to give thanks to God and worship him. I want to begin to exalt his holy name. Adore him, praise him, worship him, elevate him. Adore his holy name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Bight and the Morning Star, the Root of Jesse, the God who had been from time immemorial, the one who says that it's coming to pass, let's praise him. Let's honor him. Let's worship him. Let's exalt him. Let's say, Father, you are good. Jesus, you are good. The Holy Ghost, you are great. You are wonderful. You are excellent and you are beautiful. 